So today is um, really exciting because we're continuing our exploration of providing high quality labor trafficking services to survivors of labor trafficking by digging into how supervisors can set up their team for success from day one. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, uh, Chris Perez. Chris has decades of experience in direct service and supervising staff um, working with adult and child survivors of trafficking and other crimes. He knows the landscape of the field really well and also the power of developing a really confident, well-informed and compassionate team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Megan. And yeah, you made me feel pretty old there saying decades of experience, but thanks for that, I appreciate it. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to Framework for putting this together um, and allowing me to talk about the subject. Uh, I know that we have a lot of material to cover today, so I'll get started right away with the objectives. Um, in developing the webinar, we really wanted to address an issue that's come up uh, to Framework's attention, uh, which is not just uh, labor trafficking uh, 101 uh, training that can be developed, but in particular, um, something that supervisors can use as an orientation when new hires. Uh, or new hiring um, when that's when that process is getting started. So um, particularly in how to assist um, in developing and working with this. So um, we're hoping that that this is what we're going to be doing. And uh, in breaking this down, we thought of four main learning objectives. Uh, the first is discussing uh, general practices in staff onboarding, um, followed by discussing uh, various labor trafficking topics um, option. And this is kind of options for supervisors. Uh, that they may have uh, with in working with new staff. Uh, third, third, it'd be including uh, resources and materials. Uh, we divided it in between uh, essential and recommended. Um, and we'll be discussing a little more on that and giving you some details later on. And lastly, we'll be discussing special considerations uh, when um, delivering services to labor trafficking victims, survivors. So let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind, Megan. Okay, so before we even get started with these uh, with these objectives, I wanted to include this slide because some of you might say, um, Chris, how are you expecting us to develop this? When, how, we barely have time to provide services, report on the services that were being provided, um, developing partnerships, we're exhausted with the work that we have, and uh, there's staff burnout and that sort of stuff, right? So um, even you as a supervisor might be burnt out and um, I completely understand that. Uh, we're on your side, we understand. Um, and all those are very real challenges and honestly, there are probably more that you're facing that were not included in this slide. Um, but with that being said, we hope that you, um, that if you do have the time to work on this, um, you can not only help your staff be prepared, but ultimately help those survivors that you're serving um, with this type of training. So um, I'll get more in depth into that a little shortly, but I did wanna take a minute to say that we understand the what we, I guess, would be the contextual challenges you face um, on a daily basis uh, that are hard to work around. So again, we hope that uh, that you see the benefit in having this type of training and that um, you do get some time to set, set it up for your staff. Excellent, perfect, okay. So now we'll be talking a little bit about best practices in hiring staff uh, that provide a foundation for what we're looking to set up for the, for the new incoming staff. Um, and generally speaking, uh, we want all staff, all new staff employees to integrate to an agency and its culture, right? Um, as well as getting him or her the tools or information uh, needed to become a productive member. So uh, we also know that employees normally get around 90 days to prove themselves in a job or what's considered, I guess, a probation period. Um, and every organization has their own way of how they want to hire um, or how they want their new staff to learn about attitudes, increasing their knowledge, skills, and behaviors, that sort of stuff. But the bottom line is that the faster um, the new hires feel welcomed and feel prepared for their jobs, the faster they'll be successful, right, uh, and be able to contribute. So uh, furthermore, we also need to consider that there's an uh, informal and formal onboarding process. Uh, informal onboarding would be something that where the employee learns about his or her new job without an explicit plan, an organizational plan, while formal onboarding, on the other hand, is uh, there's a written procedure for this and policies, um, and that helps the new hire to have specific tasks and socialization that's related to it. So, and in particular, research shows that organizations and agencies that um, have an, a formal onboarding process that have step-by-step -step, um, employee 
um, yeah, I guess steps we'll say, um, to, to teach them all these rules, um, it really, really helps them become more effective soon. So that's just something that we want to share. And generally speaking, um, onboarding new hires for an organization should be strategic and um, a process that should last around a year from what um, research has said. And um, so, yeah, just as, as a general note, um, something that, um, that you might want to ask is how long this is going to last, what we were asking initially, what impressions you want the new hire to, to have in their first day, that sort of stuff. Um, and so, okay, in, in terms of um, timeframes and goals, two main goals on the first day should be setting expectations and introducing objectives. Uh, employees uh, need to have, I guess, like a pretty clear, crystal clear idea about what their job duties are and responsibilities starting that one day. And um, in addition, understanding um, the responsibilities and roles that are expected of them in the coming weeks. Um, and it's also been documented that if you have a mentor or somebody that they can shadow, um, it really, really can benefit them. Um, of course, with being very clear with the roles that, that are being described, right? For both, uh, both staff members that will be involved. And lastly in the slide, um, I highlighted some that can take place in the coming months, like having monthly check-ins, uh, requesting feedback. And that being said though, um, again, it might vary depending on the staff experience or context that might be, place, might be taking place. Um, some supervisors like having weekly check-ins for the first few months. Um, others just have a different setup, so it really comes to what you believe works best. Um, with that in mind, please remember that it's important for you to know your staff, constantly checking in on them um, when they're starting the job. Not only uh, is this important for your staff to feel support, but also uh, it'll give an, a supervisor an opportunity to, to know about the different learning styles that the staff might have. Uh, so for example, if they're visual learners, if they're hands-on learners and whatnot, it can impact the way you organize yourself and the types of trainings that, that you believe will be most beneficial to them. So let's go to the next slide if you don't mind. Thank you, Megan. Um, so this is a visual map that we created that we um, that can be helpful to understanding and making sure that we have a proper goal when training a, a new staff member, right? Um, so I'm going to start from the bottom, actually. All supervisors want to have a positive impact, of course, uh, with, the, with the survivors um, we're working with, but uh, with the staff as well, right? Uh, we want to make sure that, th that we're developing a trusting relationship that'll allow the staff and survivors to grow. Uh, so how do we achieve that, right? The first concept is that we need to offer new staff members the necessary skills in that sense, uh, we need highly skilled individuals at their job that are confident and um, that are also doing um, an empathetic job that um, it's effective, that there's that their approach is effective, um, and that they're achieving this, um, or yeah, this is achieved by a new staff having a clear message, understanding expectations, and that there's guidance and training in the proper subjects. So the direct staff supervisor is the main person that'll be coordinating specific trainings and day-to-day -day tasks and the, the roles and whatnot, right? So, but this also comes from a, what, what I guess we could call a culture um, and from leadership and HR policies, right? So what's important to say as well is that if your agency doesn't believe in specific types of trainings or doesn't value trafficking, say, and to the degree that you'd want, maybe the more of the responsibility is going to fall on the direct supervisor or on the new staff member so that they can learn the subject on their own. Um, so it might vary for everybody there. And um, lastly, uh, we'll, we'll also be... Uh, something to highlight in this map is that we're not only gonna be influenced by this, but also partner agencies and other staff members and also the individual's background, right? Uh, so it's important to know and acknowledge where people are coming from um, that might influence the message that you or your agency are coming across. So to wrap up the section, um, new staff may be feeling lost, disoriented, unsure of themselves, even I guess confused. Um, it's very easy to feel that way initially uh, if too much information is going their way. So with agency policies, learning about their role, learning about reporting systems, um, getting to know the new staff that, that are in part of the team, et cetera. Um, because of that, it's important to not only state that it's normal to feel overwhelmed, but to offer them support like resources, uh, additional ongoing support. And rather than reading all that's on the slide right now, one that we wanted to make sure that we highlighted properly um, is role playing. Uh, while some might find that it's a little uncomfortable, um, it, it really can can describe to you and to your staff the different scenarios 
that you might be going over and concepts that you might want to come across um, with intakes, for example, we'll go over that here in a little bit, uh, but that's, it's crucial for you or your agency to that, that rapport building. So uh, again, that's, that's another activity that, that can come up. Um, and lastly, uh, throughout the onboarding process, it's important for, for you to have space uh, to give the space because uh, it gives the staff opportunity to to observe the organization and think if they want to be more like the people that they're that are around them and also ask themselves what type of unique perspective uh, they can bring to the table right um, so creating that space for conversation as a supervisor is going to be very important so i think yeah so now we're going to the to the question here so um on this first act activity i'd say uh we're interested in learning about the type of activities that you've incorporated in the past uh, into your orientations. Uh, that includes, uh, but but isn't limited, I guess, to shadowing games or uh, independent reading. So, you know, please answer and let us know. You know, we'd, we'd love to hear about what, you, what you've been doing up until now. And in this case, please, I know that, um, if you need to an answer, you can also use the QR code and um, make sure that you feel that you can be represented. Role plays, so so people have been including role plays already. Learn as you go. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that one. Giving scenarios and asking to assess and respond. Perfect, okay, absolutely. Attend meetings, perfect. Absolutely so, information gathering. Scenarios and brainstorming, perfect. Watch videos, absolutely. Links to shared folders for resources, perfect. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a lot of um, material that we'll be talking about here and the or opportunities that we'll be talking about throughout the training um, that you'll also find will help out. So meeting with colleagues and stakeholders, introduction to the department. Perfect. Okay. Uh, role plays where other staff watch the scenario. And I'm guessing also provide feedback in that sense. So perfect. Okay. Um, and listen, I'd love to talk a little bit more about this, but I know that for time purposes, Megan, you're probably already telling me, Chris, you got to rush. I'm sorry. I can get a little long-winded. So um, resource training, OVC modules. Absolutely. We'll bring those up here in a bit too. So let's, I think we should go to the next slide if that's okay. Okay. So, and before jumping into to the actual labor trafficking material to cover, uh, we'd like to state that before even getting into it, um, it's okay for a supervisor not to know something, right? You don't have to be an expert on labor trafficking. Um, you do have the support and can reach out to others, uh, including actually people in framework, right? Um, or partners in the community as well that you might feel comfortable with reaching out to. Um, but based on experience, we also need to acknowledge that there are layers to labor trafficking and it might take um, a longer time than you want to feel somewhat comfortable in talking about it. So um, in fact, we also do have to remember that labor trafficking is something that you constantly need to be learning about. Um, there are different avenues to learn about it, about this crime in general. So you do want to have that perspective. Um, and again, as supervisors know that, um, that you have the support to understand that this is a challenging issue um, and that, um, that, yeah, that you aren't alone, basically, right? Um, so that's what we did want to say before going in here. <laughs> so let's go to this next slide. Okay, so now we're going into topics um, uh, within labor trafficking that can be helpful when developing a, a labor trafficking training for your new staff, right? Um, the first uh, I consider important um, is understanding labor trafficking at a global level, um, how labor trafficking uh, affects different industries all over the world, and um, and it all puts into comes into perspective, right? Puts things into perspective um, because it is happening all over the world. Um, the second part is uh, labor trafficking uh, within the national landscape, um, including important uh, federal and state laws for staff to know, uh, relevant definitions to understand, and really then personalizing it uh, to labor trafficking in our communities and uh, the organization's approach that you work with uh, to all of it, right? So to wrap up the final section uh, is preparing to offer services to survivors and of course why details in this sense are important. So let's see if we can go to the next slide. 
Fuck. Okay. Make it. I lost the feed of the presentation. Charlie or Regina, are you guys there? Hi, oh. and we are here. We are just having some technical difficulties and we will have the power. Right back on. <laughs> right on. A minute to have a drink of water. Sorry about that, guys. My internet went down. It's suboptimal time. Let me get my <laughs> slide back up for you. Can you see that? Yes. And I think okay. it's the next slide there. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So, again, the global component of trafficking and specifically labor trafficking. Um, this is a, really a, a short slide. Um, however, what we'd recommend is to highlight worldwide data, data points, uh, as well as case examples. So in addition to that, for context purposes, it's useful for staff to know about um, how the United Nations is defining human trafficking, um, what approach um, they are taking towards this, especially considering that the UN's Palermo Protocol was adopted the same year as the United States, um, or, or when the US passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act uh, in the year 2000. So it's good just for, for context purposes, right? Uh, and in terms of, of case examples, um, some that I believe are useful um, are those that might catch people's attention, right? Or, or hit home, even though they might not be expecting it. So for example, a case involving the shrimp processing factory in Thailand related to the Fatana uh, Seafood Company. Uh, on the surface, of course, this is, it's a strong case just because it involves workers' documents being retained, uh, workers unable to leave until their debts are paid off. But really what catches people's attention um, is, is the, that large companies like Walmart and others uh, were involved in this case, um, as those shrimps in particular were being sold there, right? So, and the same thing goes with, uh, with an active lawsuit right now uh, with cocoa plantations uh, in the Ivory Coast um, that have large companies like Marge, Hershey's, Nestle, and others uh, involved in a lawsuit with miners forced to work on those plantations. And honestly, I don't want to say that I'm not trying to put any of these companies in a bad light at all. Uh, the purpose is really trying to show examples of how large companies might be involved without maybe even knowing, right? And um, how you all as supervisors can present this to new staff and open their eyes um, to, to the types of cases that are taking a place throughout the world, right? Um, so yeah, I guess let's, let's go to the next slide too. Perfect, so here's the next angle to present, right? Uh, on labor trafficking and it's really important one, um, it's crucial for new staff to understand definitions in the United States. Uh, in this case, they need to know how the uh, Trafficking Victims Protections Act defines labor trafficking and specific components like what, uh, what's considered domestic servitude, forced labor, involuntary servitude. Um, of course, important definitions like forced fraud and coercion as it applies to adults and minors for labor trafficking. Uh, what's the difference between child labor versus child exploitation? Um, labor violations as well, um, all of that. So many of you listening into this webinar probably have federal grants, um, which again, it's important for staff to know how the federal government defines all these terms as it'll help identify and understand the nuances in labor trafficking. Um, and lastly, in terms of, of industries, um, we included a long list um, that you can offer uh, your staff to learn about and dig into as labor trafficking can, involve, can be involved in all, all types of industries. Uh, the industries um, you may want to focus on, of course, are those that, um, that might be most relevant to your service area, but I do recommend trainings as uh, they might be um, in various types of industries you, that you might be interested in and, and can benefit your staff. So again, in terms of having a baseline foundation for your staff, having this type of information as starting points uh, will be very useful as well. Actually also data that um, we'll be presenting here and talking about shortly uh, can be really useful. So next slide here. Perfect, okay. So in this case, um, the same way that I included uh, case examples at a global level, uh, it's important to, to not only learn about uh, or also learn about cases at a national level, not only because it'll help um, learn about you know cases that are hitting closer to home, but survivors um, that were part of these cases might also actually end up moving to your service area, right? And so you might need to know 
uh, about those cases. And so honestly, to be short here, um, here there, you can have um, two cases to learn about. The first is an agricultural case, um, Global Horizons uh, case that involved two to 400 Thai workers uh, and companies like Del, Front, Del, sorry, Del Monte Fresh Produce, um, which took place in farm areas in the United States like Hawaii or Washington State. And the second is in the hospitality industry, which is the giant labor solutions, five-star cleaning, and I believe crystal management. Um, front, which they fronted as a labor subcontracting uh, agency for housekeeping recruitments. Um, and they, yeah, they recruited hundreds of workers uh, from overseas. So these are examples, um, I'm being brief again for time purposes, but um, there's a lot to these cases that new staff can learn about regarding all types of aspects when it comes to, to labor trafficking. So let's go to this next slide here. Okay, in this slide, I wanted to highlight a few things. And again, I'm trying to be brief because there's a lot of material we want to go through. So um, one is that we discussed um, having an understanding of the federal law, right? And definitions related to, to trafficking is essential, but, oh, sorry, there we go. Okay, um, but to understand um, staff's knowledge, uh, it's important to be for them to understand the state laws related to trafficking, right? Um, and while state laws generally, um, use definitions that follow the same guidelines as a federal language, states can also develop laws associated to trafficking that are important to learn about. So for example, I'll just highlight one in this slide, um, which um, is in the state of Wisconsin known as Melinda's Law. Um, this is associated to traveling sales crews, uh, where many labor trafficking cases have been identified actually. Um, as, as a supervisor, we, we understand that it's very hard to be aware of all the different types of laws, um, but, so, and for you to feel comfortable with all this. So um, the new employee, um, like say you can create a list of potential laws that they as new staff can research and you know you can create activities for them to, um, for further learning. Um, and it includes maybe you know, like open discussions about the implications um, and so forth. But uh, the goal here is to help mold uh, the staff thinking that beyond a reaction response approach, um, it can also be, uh, towards prevention, right, uh, with how laws can assist for um, these types of cases uh, for happening in the first place, like what's happening in, in Wisconsin. So it's good to have different approaches in this sense. So let's go to this next slide here. So, okay. Uh, so to wrap up the section uh, of labor trafficking in context, um, we wanted to share uh, ideas introducing and teaching new staff about labor trafficking at a global, national, and state level. However, of course, a major part um, that that is um, what's what does labor trafficking look like in our communities, right? What types of cases have we seen? What industries have been affected by it, uh, gaps or challenges that we see and so on? So all of this ties together with um, what what is the agency's approach to this type of work? How are we assisting with this, right? This is an opportunity not only to do role playing again, to learn about specific types of scenarios, but um, also for your agency um, to display uh, their role as a community and, and as a staff member as well. Let's go to this next slide, please. Perfect, okay. So in preparing to, to identify um, survivors to, uh, to start this component in this slide, we wanted to reiterate ideas and key messages uh, for staff throughout the process. Um, we discussed uh, this earlier in the presentation, but also in this, um, this presentation that Framework has done, um, like the survivor perspective event um, that took place recently, um, it's important to know um, ourselves and take care of ourselves um, as as it's crucial for us to keep learning and uh, improving ourselves. So, um, so yes, engagement um, is the work. Um, I'm reiterating the idea that uh, you don't have to know everything from in day one. Um, there's a lot of material to dig into. Uh, you do have the support, um, and you are not really you are not alone. And really, you can't be doing this type of work on your own. You're part of a larger community doing this work, uh, and taking care of yourself is not only an act uh, of service to yourself, but uh, to your clients and that you're working with as well. Um, so, in this sense, uh, we do what we do for our clients, um, but it's equally important when it comes to the to the survivor experience as a whole. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, in this case. Um, another aspect that preparing your staff um, is uh, includes identifying assumptions uh, individuals um, 
individuals impact might have. Um, and it can be helpful to test your bias or hidden stereotypes that we might have. So assumptions that might uh, affect our service delivery. So for example, um, I've heard in, in some situations in labor cases that males um, might not need as much assistance with mental health. Um, they say they're fine, so it should be okay, right? Um, if you go into a case with that type of mentality, it can impact how you talk to people, how you might give, how you might advocate for them, for example. Um, so it might be a good opportunity to address potential discomforts as well. Um, like for example, with language lines, Google Translate, um, and how um, to work especially around that, uh, because you might be the, the best service provider in the area to provide the services, right? Um, so you have to prepare your staff for that. And lastly, um, another uh, test that you can do, um, it's an interesting opportunity also to reflect on, uh, is to potentially discuss with your staff uh, what Made in a Free World offers, uh, which tests the slavery footprint as individuals um, that we have depending on our lifestyle and choices. So these are just additional ideas that you can throw around with your staff. Okay, so all of this should lead um, or should leave your staff really questioning or asking themselves, how does labor trafficking apply to me uh, in the community I live in? Um, how, how will all of this type of training affect the service delivery that I'm offering? Um, I know most of the time case managers or social workers, uh, we don't have a moment to reflect, right? However, it is very important to allow your staff to learn about this for best practices. Um, choices that can be approved upon. Um, as a supervisor, it's important to give your, your staff um, time. Um, it's an opportunity to guide them and um, go over some questions. It, it is very important to go over that. So that's what we're trying to say with this slide. So let's go to this next one. Perfect. Okay. So this leads to this diagram that I know can be a little intimidating when I see it down. Um, but when we created it, um, as a supervisor, uh, when you're looking at, at uh, with a new staff, it's important for you to educate and explain the different types of partnerships that might be um, might need to be involved in a labor trafficking case. Uh, so in this model, you can see, generally speaking, agencies uh, that would normally be working with a labor case are those in the triangle um, and surround that are surrounding the labor trafficking survivor, right? So social service providers, law enforcement, and legal assistance normally um, do not only um, or should be, shouldn't only be working on this case, but um, they, the, the intermittent lines that you see there, um, again, while those are different agencies that are separating them, the idea is that they're communicating. That's why there are, there's that line of communication. Uh, in addition to those partnerships, uh, you need staff um, or your new staff uh, should also have an understanding of additional agencies that you should be working with or that you could be working with. So this includes national agencies like uh, the Department of Labor or the National Human Trafficking Hotline, Polaris. Um, and of course, we, we can't forget partners in like uh, community advocates, churches, religious affiliate, religiously affiliated agencies, um, as well as embassies or consulates. And finally, if you're working with, uh, with, with a minor case, you can see in the red box um, that have listed additional partners that you might want to reach out to. But as a supervisor, you might uh, help your staff to be prepared on, on this, um, how it might be helpful to have contacts um, and, or that if you don't have them already, that you're working on them, et cetera. Um, it should always help out to have this type of case uh, or this type of relationship. Um, and having that rapport with staff is crucial to move quickly um, when providing services with labor case. So having this slide visually also might be, might help survivors or supervisors, sorry, um, if they don't have contacts and that way they can make sure that, that they reach out to people as well. And, um, and you could see um, what would benefit in this sense. So up until this point in the webinar, we've covered, I guess, I think a lot of material and a lot of concepts. Um, so uh, I want to make sure that, that before we go on, um, it, let me see here, uh, that, I think there's something else. Um, I don't know if there's something that, um, that we created now that, yes, I believe. We'll. So um, if there's, any resources up until now that you might feel like that we needed to um, cover right now or we didn't talk a lot about, I think we can go to this next slide now, I believe that we'll be talking about. Oh, sorry, that just goes right there. So, okay, this is where I wanted to get to. So I know that, that there's a lot of cases, data points, uh, different agencies that I talked about. Um, and 
it includes, and so to really get a good handle on all this stuff, we understand that time's limited. It's kind of hard to get through all this, right? So um, there's there's a resource guide that uh, that was developed for for this presentation as well. That includes uh, websites um, as well as uh, just general data points uh, that talk about labor trafficking at a global level, or resources and legal framework in the U.S. Um, federal agencies that offer information and guidance, um, NGO resources, videos, people that have mentioned that, videos when we see uh, data um, and everything like that, that you'll find useful. And if you go to this next slide, I think that we're still talking about, perfect, okay. Um, so in this case, we also talk about um, the private sector's response to human trafficking, uh, companies like Coca-Cola um, and their response, um, all of their materials, very useful to learn from. Case studies, uh, so like some that I was mentioning, including, um, also outreach materials in the training um, and, and training, sorry, um, as well as people and specifically for people with lived experiences, um, there's also additional links that you can read about. So this resource guide will, uh, will include links and descriptions to everybody um, that, that you might be interested in. Um, so that will be shared. Um, and we believe that um, that's very, very useful. Um, so please keep it in mind um, and use the information that's gonna be shared with uh, when you're developing your own training. Um, to see what, what you might find very helpful, you know? So it's perfect, okay. So um, in starting to wrap up uh, the, the presentation in some sort of ways, uh, we wanted to highlight um, the most, uh, I guess, what's leading us to provide um, the best services that we can, right, for survivors. So, uh, and this includes um, tools that we potentially use, right? Um, and in this, what we're trying to say is that we want staff to be as prepared as possible, and that includes the intake process, right? So it's very important for supervisors to prepare their staff for this, um, identifying the best intake tool um, that you or your staff agency can use. Um, with, and with that being said, in particular for labor cases, uh, it's important to empower and educate your staff to follow, to have follow-up questions. Um, that, that might be needed, I guess, when you're working a case, right? Um, if you train your staff in a proper way with follow-up questions that might come up, come up it'll be extremely helpful uh, when they're out in the field. Um, and another best practice is that um, since identifying labor cases is challenging uh, or even finding services for them, uh, it's important to establish a routine of debriefing with your staff. Um, and um, whether it's about intake or cases that, that are yet yeah, uh, providing services to in general, uh, but having that team environment that'll support or, or give you a different perspective can be beneficial. Um, and another aspect that'll, that'll be important to train your staff on um, is contacting the potential victim or and contacting and communicating really um, about the next steps that you, that'll be following up with. Uh, be clear with the limitations, never over promising, uh, sharing what uh, your intention is in the next steps and follow up. Um, but yeah, so it would, which includes this last point and make referrals um, and to the partner or community agencies that you believe might be able to assist with your case. So that's, that's something else that needs to be included in the, in the trainings. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here um, I wanted to bring back concepts from the um, from the original. Sorry. Okay, so I'm sorry. I just I'm losing part of the. Well, I'm having issues here. I'm sorry. I'm having issues with my internet. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? All right. We can hear you. Am I on the right slide for you, Chris? Uh, I believe so. I'm just having some issues here. Can you see the screen? Yeah, but it's, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I think, so. I think we're, we're still on the slide of the population. Yes, okay. So yep. in this case, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so here we're, we're using just some examples um, about specific populations that you can um, be offering potential um, additional trainings for, right? So of course, minors being a vulnerable, vulnerable group. Um, we included US minors as well as unaccompanied minors. Um, they have different vulnerabilities that can be expected um, and that can be exploited. Um, so as, as well as um, members from the LGBTQ plus or the uh, BIPOC community, homeless youth, adults and minors, uh, documented or undocumented minors, people with disabilities, and the list can go on really. Um, but what's good about this type of, of list for, for supervisors is that you can talk to your staff uh, and prepare them as best as you can 
about all of these groups, right? Um, and address the intake considerations as as well as provide services and that sort of stuff um, that you're expecting of them. So a tool that can be used here um, that we that we discussed again earlier uh, is role playing, right? So understanding the many types of um, or that there there isn't a lot of time, right, to talk about these types of exercises, but Again, in understanding the nuances of, of say, these different um, listed populations, it's really important to take that in, in to consideration. And really, uh, another part in this slide that's something that I wanted to bring up uh, again from the from the previous framework um, perspectives event was something that I believe Mr. Kwame was talking about, um, which was showing survivors that you'll be there for them um, and express that support in particular um, as a as a supervisor. Uh, it's important to pass along that message and make sure um, for your new staff to know that super that survivors have expressed the importance of this and why it's important that how it impacts the rapport and building trust. Um, so no matter what population you're working with, whether it's a list uh, or group that's listed here or not, uh, it's important to share that. So that's something else that I wanted to talk about there. Okay, so at all times, um, we wanted to discuss that there are upcoming trainings that um, that framework's also offering, um, and in this case, the subject that um, that are that's important to learn about from from a survivor's uh, perspective is that what is particular in trauma. And um, another topic uh, that will be uh, discussed about labor trafficking is the participation in the workforce, uh, followed by financial planning um, and also fi uh, family dynamics. Um, all these are highly useful, um, so please keep this in mind uh, in the upcoming months um, that I'm sure that Megan will be also sharing information about. Um, let me see here. So, perfect. Okay, so now we're going to another question. Um, what kind of, and we want to find out from you guys, what kind of impact do you guys think um, your new employees' orientations on labor trafficking uh, will have on the survivor's experience uh, with your staff and agency? So, please share your thoughts uh, and let us know. Like, again, how you guys feel this type of training will impact your, your new staff. And please use Slido, you guys. Will help with rapport building. Perfect. Absolutely, any other thoughts? Can I jump in, Chris? And here's Absolutely. something that's come up for me as other folks enter their their responses is the idea of building staff confidence that when you come into a new organization, especially if you're um, limited in your experience in the workforce generally, this is big work and meaningful and sort of high stakes, depending on how you think about it. And the ability to have the support from your supervisor, even just to say you don't need to know everything right now on day one, that you're part of a team, um, that really matters in terms of the way that you approach your work. All of the skills and knowledge will come over time, but that ability to recognize your own competence as you start out from day one, I think is, is something that a supervisor has a lot of power to influence. Absolutely, and I think that sometimes um, people, when it comes to labor trafficking, don't know the types of questions that they might have. Um, so just you know, reading and, and seeing different types of, of role playing can always can always help out, um, and, and seeing how people would react to that. Um, seems like there's a lot of comments here. Um, so yeah, environment of continuous learning, add credibility, building empathy and trust, um, less missteps with clients. Absolutely. Um, ongoing support network with um, agency in times of uncertainty, lead to less assumptions, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's, we can, unless we're seeing more participation, Megan, are we seeing? Do you wanna I think hold we're up? good to move on. These are great ideas. Perfect, absolutely, yeah. So uh, here I wanted to bring back, um, the concepts from the initial part of the presentation, or even the first question, uh, orientation schedules. Um, and um, let me see here, I think we can go to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so um, I know that um, it's very hard to really come up with something like this. We know because of time purposes and that sort of stuff, um, but it's at least to get the ideas rolling, right? Um, 
And um, if we're talking about just general concepts that we've been throwing out there, I think that it that you can re bring this up in different types of mechanisms and different avenues. Um, but um, it does always highlight when I'm looking at this. I mean, I believe Megan, we're going to be including this in the, in the different resources that's available to to people that are participating, so you guys can can tailor it to your own needs. But again, these are just ideas. Um, but it is important to have continuous training, and I know. If I remember correctly, in the initial question, people generally have one week, or that's how long people have been doing these types of trainings. So um, here, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys would would potentially develop after this type of training, and see what you guys would find useful to your staff. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's what. I'm and I'm sorry, make it. I, I'm going in and out with the internet. Can you guys hear me all right? Still, I'm hoping that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So. Of course, professional development is always needed with labor trafficking. Um, there are always components to learn about, as I said, said before, uh, trends, populations that need to get services, gaps identified and whatnot. But um, labor trafficking is a workers issue um, that needs to keep in mind, that we need to keep in mind uh, when working these cases. Uh, it can impact our community in many ways. Um, and um, so please feel motivated uh, to join task forces, committees, coalitions um, that are working on these issues as well. And um, finally, when it comes to labor trafficking, please be creative, be innovative with what the needs are. Even listen, reach out also to, to Megan to see, you know, maybe they can also develop certain um, ideas that you're looking into, you know? Um, it's, it's important for us to keep um, this kind of um, process alive and to see what's out there because you guys are still in, in the forefront. And as supervisors, uh, you might have a, a bigger voice as to what might your staff might need that we might be able to help out with. So I believe with, with that being said, um, we can open it up to questions, unless Megan, there's something else that, that you'd want me to, to highlight or bring up. No, I think you've done a really comprehensive job of giving supervisors a good sense of sort of the, the frame of mind um, as they're approaching a new staff orientation when it comes to what to incorporate around labor trafficking, around how to have discussions and some of the nuances and to tailor it to the community, right? This isn't something that can be a one size fits all, but you've really sort of got to have an understanding of what's happening in your community and the people that you're serving. So there's a lot to chew on. Um, I'm going to toss it to Charlie in just one second to um, share some of the questions that have come through from the audience. But first, I just want to remind folks to please take the survey at the end of the event to let us know what you thought, what was great, how we can improve for future. We really do read all of those notes and suggestions from you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shirley. I know we've gotten at least a couple questions in the Q&A and keep them coming. All right, great questions that we have here so far. So I'm going to start with, um, are there any online trainings you recommend? A lot of our onboarding is remote and self-guided. So I think that actually the, the resource guide is gonna offer a lot to in that sense, because whether it's like OVC, you know, like, again, it's going to depend on the type of in-depth training that, that you're going to need. But um, like, for example, OVC in the resource guide, I know that that's included, um, can, can really talk about it. There are also um, links to different types of cases that you might want to discuss um, internally um, and, and kind of have just a moment to, um, to talk with your staff about that as well. So I, I'd recommend that you start at least with the with that resource guide that, that we worked on um, to see if that can help out. And if anything, of course, you know, reach back out to us and we can see additional material online that, that you might find uh, necessary or useful. But that's just some of it. it. Yeah, just a tip of the iceberg, but a yes. pretty exhaustive resource guide that we've put together for you and your new staff today. Um, one of my favorite ones is uh, Crystal's story. And the next question we'll go to is, are there any safety considerations with labor trafficking survivors we should include in our trainings? Absolutely, actually. And, you know, we, we discussed initially whether we should include that as part of the presentation or not. But I know that there might be additional trainings talking about intakes and whatnot. But I think that the safety aspect and I know that like from just from personal experience in, and going out there and, and being and doing intakes and putting myself at risk more than what I would have no, I think like now looking back, it's, you have to be very uh, cautious, you know, like for example, just walking into a trafficker's house without even knowing, right? Cause you're trying to, to help somebody out that didn't 
say is that that's your stuff. I would say that absolutely, and that's part of role playing. The type of uh, as a supervisor, you do need to make sure that you are um, always um, aware of where that staff member might be, um, and that um, in the sense of okay, hey, I'm going to do this intake. Okay, where is it going to be? Is it going to be in an open area? Is it like, are you, do you need to go with somebody? Like that, that component definitely needs to be taken into consideration. It should be the, the, the staff safety as well, as, of course, the survivor safety that needs to be taken into consideration when, when planning this out. But I think, Megan, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's that there might be additional trainings that might be addressing general intake considerations. Yeah. Um... Screening and intake is a really popular topic that folks are interested in for good reason, because there's a lot right. to dig into there in terms of thinking about your role and the type of tool that's appropriate for you, being really conscious of the types of questions you're asking and what's really relevant for you, given your, the role that you're playing. Um, we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatizing survivors if they're telling us their story when we don't actually need to know their story. We're there to help them find housing or reunify with their family or meet some of their other needs. Your trauma story is um, is not critical for you to share with a case manager. Oftentimes, so um, there's a lot a lot to dig into there. So we're going to be developing not just an event, but a whole slew of supplemental resources to to um, help equip folks to tackle that. But yes, in short, your question is yes, safety definitely something that should be addressed. Yes, sounds like a lot of considerations and opportunities to orient staff on how to keep themselves safe your agency safe and the client safe in the short and long term. Would you suggest repeating trainings as a refresher for staff? If so, how often do you think that this would be helpful? I think that it depends because I think that those that are, that feel very comfortable with, like that have been say in the field for a long time, might not need a one-on-one, but that um, certain perspectives need to be brought into. So, you know, whether it is role playing with a different scenario, right? So like, yeah, you've worked with so many cases, perfect, okay, but what if there's a nuance to it that you weren't expecting um, and, and tools that might have uh, been different that, you know, so in that sense, it's good to refresh it. And also, you know, if, if somebody feels very comfortable with it, then, you know, maybe ask them to also, you know, lead that type of training. How well do you actually know it? A lot of times when you actually have to verbalize concepts, that's when you know if you know the, the material very well, but I would say that, it doesn't hurt, but maybe presenting it from a different angle, you know? Very, very good point. And I think that, you know, with with all things, there's staff turnover and that you are very likely the, the best person to judge that for your particular agency. Yeah. And something I did want to say is that some of the information that uh, that was presented today can go for both sex and labor trafficking, like, for example, the safety components of it, of course, you know, it could go for, for both scenarios. But, um, but of, of course, there's more that, that you can also talk about in either at like, um, types of trafficking that you'd be talking about. Um, all right, so this person works at a domestic, um, predominantly with domestic violence survivors, and human trafficking survivors. We do human trafficking trainings, but staff still treat survivors the same, even though their needs and experiences are different. Any tips or advice to address this? I think that what that will be interesting is that, like, I don't know the types of, of general trainings that they do for, for domestic violence um, and just general abuse, but I do think that um, in, like, for example, one of the trainings that, that or we talked about that are going to be coming up are about trauma, right? And how trauma can, can affect, because people I've, I've seen a lot of times um, don't take into consideration the, the, the trauma impact that labor trafficking cases might have, right? So in that case, um, not only say attending this upcoming training, but also I think that, you know, in, in seeing the, the specific needs that, that labor trafficking cases might have, or just trafficking in general, um, while the populations are also very, very mixed, um, a lot of the times because there are there aren't a lot of housing opportunities for emergency shelters right that generally is domestic violence shelters from what we see um is that if you do actually pay it to additional attention to their their specific case is that there, there are nuances to it and if you do want to learn about it there are trainings that will specifically identify the differences between db and, and trafficking right um and let alone labor trafficking because i know that 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 makes it even more complicated 
um, there's, there, I'm sorry about this one last thing there. I know there are cultural components as well that need to take into, need to be taken into consideration, you know, um, that, that always should be brought up by staff. Um, so I hope that that kind of helps out, but, um, if you would like to, to talk a little bit more about the types of trainings that, that you would like to have specifically for your, um, for your staff at, at a DB shelter so they can learn about it. I think that, you know, everybody on, on this call right now, um, you know, making sure we, uh, Regina or myself would be more than happy to, to talk to you about it and see what angles you would feel most comfortable in covering. Thank you, Chris. You know, that brings up kind of a, a secondary question to someone else's question earlier. With the safety considerations, um, there are safety considerations when you're working with sex trafficking survivors that um, I think a, a lot of organizations are already familiar with. And sorry, I just it. Um, and um, those are translatable oftentimes to labor trafficking survivors uh, with things like criminalization. A lot of people are worried about reporting because of um, fear of being persecuted themselves. Do you have any um, examples of how you've dealt with that in the past, Chris? In particular with labor cases? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So I think that in general, what it's, it's also going to come down to the tech, where the referrals are coming from, right? Because I think a lot of the times, um, the most of the labor cases, unless they're a domestic servitude case, um, that cases that have been taking place, it, like it comes from a law enforcement referral, right? Um, so if it's safe, it's coming from um, somebody that uh, is in the community and that um, you need to make sure that you have additional safeguards to it. Generally speaking, I know that if I if I was working in, in partnership with a law enforcement agency, um, we would cover some of the safety components that I might need to take into consideration, if you will, uh, where the intake would be taking place and that sort of stuff. Um, but again, I think that's going to really the, where the referral is coming from would would vary my my approach to how that would all be taking place. I hope that that addresses what you were saying or what you were asking about. Yeah, I, th I think that that makes sense. And in the past, I've worked with survivors too who were worried about things like deportation or arrest. That was one of the primary methods of control used with their trafficker. And um, I have felt that a helpful tip in employee onboarding can be opportunities of educating to kind of um, um, misinformation that traffickers have provided and um, to provide information on on how you can perhaps work with police or provide them with resources where they don't have to make a formal report or work with law enforcement. I think what makes it very challenging and again talking about intakes you know, in this case is that um, survivors a lot of times if say if they're four born um, like what you're talking about when you're asked, talking about deportation and whatnot is that they might not understand the structure of providers here in the United States. They, they might not understand social service providers versus why they're working with law enforcement versus why there's an attorney, why there are different types of attorneys. Like that structure in itself might cause a lot of confusion for them. Um, and so initially, it's very, very hard to, to create that rapport and to make sure that they understand that while people might be working together, they work for different agencies and that um you know of course they communicate but that it, it's you don't have the same um response as an agency if that makes sense so that that's a challenge that, that we all need to go through for sure i know that for a fact and seem challenge and opportunity to think about at your agency absolutely so we have a couple more minutes if anyone has a last minute question throw it into the chat throw it into the q and a Otherwise, please don't forget about our satisfaction survey. Chris has put so much work into this, but is always seeking feedback. He lets us know that constantly, as is framework. So we want you to drive not only benefiting um, and increasing our resources that we've already created, um, but also that we create and perhaps redo in the future as we continue in our program. And one last thing is we do appreciate the, the interest in trying to develop this type of orientation, just because um, 
I know that some, we don't have the time, generally speaking, to, to go into certain subjects. And um, labor trafficking is a challenge in itself to learn about. So um, we appreciate that, that interest. Um, and I just wanted to say that as well. Thank you so much, Chris. And as always, I am sending this to everyone. We hope to learn from you if there are things that you feel that your agency, your region has been very successful in, in staff orientation, staff training, um, anything in working with labor trafficking survivors, we'd love to hear about it. We'd love for you to apply to be a subject matter expert with us and partner like Chris has partnered with us today. I'll hand it back to Megan to close us out. Thanks, Shirley. And thank you, Chris, again, for your thoughtful approach to this topic. It's something that I know I haven't attended a training like this and as someone who um, is both a supervisor and sort of reflecting on my experience as a new employee in various settings, I'm walking away with a lot that I'm going to chew on and think about, um, you know, how we can really set folks up for success just the day we meet them and over the course of the first few weeks. So I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and bringing all of your expertise uh, to the floor for us here today. Um, just a reminder for folks, like Charlie said, please fill out our survey for today's event. Stay in touch with us via our website. You can get in touch with us um, uh, there for everything. And uh, we hope to see you again at a future event. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Definitely. Thank you, everybody. Please reach out if anything.